our terminology, we had 11 blow buys, which means they got to the front of the rim. Um, the, the, those small plays that, that we had talked about in the press conference afterwards, looked at the, the free, uh, fr free throw block out, the, the baseline. Um, and, and then you always look at the positives too. Like, I don't think it's just you beat it up, beat it up, beat it up. So offensive execution, the game called by uh, Howard Isley and then executed by both point guards um, was, was, um, was well done. And then you turn the book, close the book on that, and you start on Michigan State. So ball screen defense, ball screen defense, ball screen defense would be where I would come out on that. We'll uh, move over to Michael Cohen from the Detroit Free Press. Hey, Phil, in terms of some of those blow buys and, and trying to address that, I guess, between now and, and Tuesday night, is that something that is more – schematic based or more like human based where the guys just need to try and anticipate better or move quicker or something like that, as opposed to an X's and O's change. No, at this time of the year, you're not going to do much X's and O change, but, but our, our uh, package is so big that we, we have to pick out what will work in those individual games. So uh, for instance, Ill in the Illinois game, we had to address Frazier and Plummer uh, because of their extraordinary shooting numbers. In the Michigan State game, Hogard and Walker, now Walker is shooting the ball very well, but Hogard is exceptional playing off the ball screen and creating for others, not so much the, the, uh, the shooting. So we'll gather as a staff and, and say, okay, here's our primary look. And I think being introspective, uh, and I know that this is a, a something that I'd, I'll stay with with my original thought. Maybe a player too long, too long, right? And uh, being introspective, I thought well, maybe we should have gone to a switching, a more aggressive switching style. Uh, yesterday earlier uh, with with Michigan State it's okay what what is it against what will be the difference between Walker who is shooting the ball well in the last several games and he's coming in off of a game winner against Purdue we have to do we have to dress him differently than Hogard and we're not there yet we we will make that decision before we meet with the team at 315. Thank you. Slide over to Andrew Kahn with M Live. Hey Phil, for, first just for context, like how many blow buys? Like, is there a number you Eleven. don't like, like typically in a game? Do you allow? That's a really good question. Uh, I don't know that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, because that, that that really goes through um, goes through Saudi, uh, and uh, I know that yesterday when we were debriefing, so I said, that's a really high number. Okay. And if you look at, our, if, and, and if you, obviously you look at our games, it's never been something where I thought, wow, we're getting, we're getting hurt uh, on this game in and game out. But it was evident, the combination, the blow by, mm -hmm. and then not having uh, rim protection. Right. So we're going to talk about that with with both Musa and Brandon and and Hunter, that there has to be some resistance at the rim because we're not going to be perfect, uh, guarding Michigan State or Iowa or, or Ohio State at the point of attack. Okay. And then as far as um, you know, we always talk to the players, uh, the freshmen or out of state guys about their indoctrination, I guess, into the Michigan Michigan State rivalry. But you know, for you, um, you know, a lifelong. Philadelphian, uh, like, can you speak to how you kind of became more familiar, obviously playing, you know, we're working for a, a boss who, who knows it very well. Well, I would say that, um, that Chris Hunter and, and Juwan Howard carry this one 
like if it's on their sleeve, then that's where that's where they they carry this one. And having been so uh, ingrained in Philadelphia, and I understand what it's like to play the Temples or the Villanovas or, uh, but I think what's extraordinary here is that the the run of successes that each of these programs has had, and um, not that they do it different, but but there's a um, there's a sense like even when you mention it to a manager or a support staff, you know the Michigan State. Well, that's different. I was like, well, why is it different than and isn't the Purdue game's really big and these teams are nationally ranked. And so I have, uh, I've marveled at it and uh, I appreciate it. And I think that, that uh, in this game, when you have an opportunity and you feel like you're competing, like almost over the water cooler, if there, or if there is such a thing anymore of a water cooler where, one guy walks up and says, go green. And the other one says, go blue. And, you know, for that moment in time. So you're playing for more than just your team. And I think that's a neat thing. I really do. I think, I think it's, it's healthy. Um, and my, 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 the, and I do think these, I do think these rivalries are healthy. We, we all know that some of these rivalries throughout the country are, they're not healthy. You know, it's, it's not sport. It, and um, it has to be taken serious and there has to be a competition. But um, when it crosses over, I, I have not felt that. You know, and, and I say this with caveat, Tom Izzo is a, a long time friend of mine. Mm -hmm. You know, like he, 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 he's done some things We've done some things together for for the NABC. Uh, he's done some things for me in uh, at different times. You know, when I was going through a tough time, wondering what was I going to do, he, that guy was on the phone with me almost every other day. Uh, you know, so. But anybody out there, Andrew, everybody that reads you, they've gone in the backyard. And they've played tackle football against their brother or their cousin or the kid across the street who they considered like a brother. And man, nobody wants to lose that one because <laughs> it's more than a loss. It stays with you until you beat them. So uh, as, as long as it's healthy. Right. Thanks. Coach, we'll uh, move over to Jack Doles from Wood TV. Phil, uh, I, I don't believe any team has ever gotten into the tournament with uh, an at-large bid with more than like three games over 500. Um, how, how do you get your guys ready for the weight of the pressure that's coming here in the couple of, uh, you got three regular season games and whatever's left in the Big Ten tournament? Nope. Doesn't happen. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. There are people that are going to sit in a room and judge your resume. So what our responsibility is, is to build that resume up. So it, it's, it really is, it, it ends up being a waste of time, particularly for young people to say, well, if we go two and one, this is gonna be good. And if we get to the semifinals of the Big Ten, that's, you, you, have no, you have no control. And it's always been control the controllable here. And what we can control is our effort for this day and then our effort for, for uh, tomorrow night. But look, do I think it's natural? And do I think that they've, it's ingenious. It is absolutely, absolutely positively ingenious the way that the committee, the NCAA has built this thing up. People have been talking about the bubble in college basketball since January 1st. Yes or no, right? They, they, well, this is the bubble, and that's the bubble. And look, a dear friend of mine, Joe Lenardi is a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. He's carved out a living doing this. 
He's five foot one. But he's carved out a living because he gets the numbers and he works it up. And now ESPN has given him a title, bracketologist. And, but any effort, any effort, uh, any time that's spent worrying, which is really what you would be doing, uh, is time away from the game. We have to, we have to improve our game. And, and we will get our just rewards. We'll move over to...